Spoilers for the 4.1 Archon Quest in Fontaine. So, the prophecy is intensifying, and boy do I have some thoughts. Let me just jump right in. The Knave is in town putting pressure on Farina to explain Child's situation. She doesn't actually care. And Newbie decides to send you down to the big underwater dungeon to investigate. You have weird dreams from Child's perspective and realize he escaped via a pipe in response to a calling. Fermine goes to investigate but is harmed when he swims into a bunch of primordial water. He ends up being okay and Mr. Handcuffs here reveals two big secrets about the Fortress of Meropede. Let's start with these primordial waters and Meropede. When the previous Hydra Archon, Egeria, ruled, all convicted criminals from Fontaine were exiled to the desolate seaside. Some began to repent and pray to Egeria. Egeria took pity on them and instructed them to guard her secret deep underneath the waves. So they built a fortress deep beneath the sea where they stayed and created their own community. Even as the secrets were lost over many centuries, Meripede of today still functions as an autonomous society of exiles. The first big reveal about Meripede is that at its bottom, there is a sluice gate with a gauge. Risley has been monitoring this gauge closely, and very recently the arrow has turned into a red alert. Risley also actually has been researching the history of Meripede and Fontaine, as well as what this gauge means. With new evidence of primordial water leaking from somewhere near the fortress, which Fremine encountered, he deduces this gauge is measuring the concentration of primordial water. It's been rising, just in line with the prophecy. Risley deduces that the primordial sea is just under this gate. So Egeria's secret, the one she asked the original exiles to guard, was this gateway to the primordial sea. The second big reveal is that Risley is basically building a ship in secret. He doesn't give too many details other than that he took inspiration from the god king Remus, who used his grand ship to create a nation, Ramuria, above the surging waves. But otherwise, it's serving Noah's Ark vibes. But Risley did mention something interesting while talking about Fontaine's history. The name of Remus's ship was Fortuna. As it turns out, the name Fortuna has some other appearances. In his investigation notes, Rene also mentions Fortuna. This is not a ship. Here, it's a conceptual cycle of civilizations rising, then falling, and new ones rising. Rene calculated his world formula independently of this, but unlike classic Fortuna, he also found that this civilization will be the last. Rene's main motivation behind the entire Narcissenkreuz subplot is stopping this, or at least circumventing the outcome. However, it is still unclear to me if Egeria's prophecy has this element of civilization disappearing forever, and what role Nartsis and Kreutz will play here. Regardless, Fortuna seems cyclical and predictable. Remuria also faced a prophecy of destruction via dissolution, and the fall of Remuria was actually basically caused by Remus's obsession with said prophecy. But there are two weird things that make me wonder about the nature of this prophecy. First thing, so after you spend like 50 million hours collecting these green crystals, you open up a cave. In this cave, there's a research note left by Master Ruggiero, which discusses ancient civilizations and their magical arts. Ruggiero defines Fortuna as a symphony, and these symphonies were used by gods to control civilizations. So perhaps Fortuna is the consequence of a higher power creating a fundamental but predictable world structure where societies are fated to rise and fall. Disclaimer, that was just my reading of it. Second weird thing related to that last part. Nouvellet describes the destructive power of the primordial waters as he's pushing it back, and after he seals it, he says, the sentence is too severe. Forgive me for overruling it. These two short lines say a lot to me. They suggest that perhaps not only might Fortuna or the prophecy be the grand design of a higher power, but one of punishment. This goes back to why Fontaine is full of sinners, albeit we don't know what the sin is. So none of that is actually either new or surprising, but there's another thing about what he said that's really, really weird. Why does Nouvellet ask for forgiveness for overruling this sentence. Because to me, and this is just my opinion, it seems that not only might he know the why and how of this higher power's design and the prophecy, it also implies that he's aligned with or even subservient to them. Put a pin in this thought and let's save it for later. Weird things aside, we see that the primordial sea, which seems to exist underneath Meripede, is rising and mixing with normal seawater. 
We also see Risley actively cooking up a plan to deal with it, and we're given further confirmation that Arlecchino does genuinely seem to care about stopping the prophecy, even agreeing to work with Traveler. And Paimon also has her own plan of saving Fontaine, using Mecha to dig holes to drain Fontaine of water. And Farina says she's been working hard to stop it as well, uh, somehow. So let's talk about her plan, and what her deal really is. For some brief background, all Oceanids are said to be born from the tears of the first Oceanid. This was Egeria, who after the Archon War became one of the Seven, until she met her death during the Conrian Cataclysm. Before her death, she foretold this prophecy to the new Hydra Archon, who presumably would also be an Oceanid born of Egeria. Currently, everyone in Fontaine accepts Farina to be the Hydra Archon, but Arlecchino expresses doubt, citing a gut feeling. Farina doesn't pass her Archon vibe check. But another thing to remember is that Rodea once implied that Oceanids don't accept the current Hydra Archon as their own, which is interesting, because Oceanids have this thing about being separate but being one. Mary Ann the Oceanid alludes to all waters returning to their source, and Endora made it pretty explicit that all Oceanids are connected. So if the Hydra Archon Farina is a daughter of Egeria and sister to all Oceanids, why the rejection? And what's the deal with all the spies and assassins? So there's more than a few weird things going on with Farina. Arlecchino makes note of how genuinely terrified she was during the attack, and also has an offhand thought that she seems to be under a curse, the effects of which we don't know. Arlecchino then had wondered if Nouvellette was the Archon in holding the Gnosis, but she later recants that sentiment. We also learn from Nouvellette himself that he is in fact the Dragon Sovereign of Hydro and not the Archon. On top of all that, Farina does not hold the Hydronosis. So, like, where is the Gnosis if not held by either Farina or Nouvellet? Where's the Gnosis, Lebowski? Well, there's been a lot of speculation that the Gnosis is within the Oratrice, and I have some speculation about how I think that could really work. The Oratrice produces a form of energy called Indemnitium during the process of rendering judgment. I've previously speculated that the Oratrice's judgment is essentially an annihilation reaction creating a form of raw, unaligned energy which I call Prime or Primal Energy. In the Arche system created by Elaine Guillotine, Numa and Ozia react with each other in an annihilation reaction to create energy which, when contained, can be harnessed for other uses, like powering Clockwork Mecha. I call this primal energy based on the fact that Elaine had studied Deshret's technology, and also because of some naming conventions seen in notes and tutorials. So I think Indemnitium is also a form of this primal energy. So consider this. The Gnosis, at its most basic use, is a core that gathers a mass of elemental power at the discretion of the Archon. So perhaps instead of a man-made container for mecha or airships, the Gnosis is the container for a very powerful annihilation reaction within the Oratrice, and a receptacle for a very large amount of primal energy. But the Oratrice is said to use people's belief in justice. This is where I really start to go off the rails, but here we go. A few things to remember. First, the Oratrice has a consciousness, self-recognition, and a will. Secondly, Archons derive strength from their people's belief in them. Third, Oceanid consciousness is weird. Their forms aren't restricted to a single body, and they can create mimics and idolins from memories. Now, I am simplifying things a little bit, but here's my scuffed crackpot theory. The true Hydro Archon resides in the Oratrice. Farina didn't create the Oratrice, rather the other way around. Farina may be a baby Ocenid or even an Eidolon born from the Hydra Archon's memories. And as for the Oratrice, belief in justice powers the Oratrice similar to how Faith powers an Archon. Numa Ozia is a phenomenon unique to Fontaine, and thus all Fontanians have it. So in channeling these beliefs, the opposing alignments of belief cause a type of annihilation reaction. And perhaps more drama means more conviction, and thus more power. The Annihilation is then funneled and contained via the Gnosis. And that's maybe how Indemnitium is created. Again, all wild speculation. But there's another really big part to this. Arlecchino had asked Farina why the Oratrice is collecting so much Indemnitium. Farina's response further confirms that she doesn't actually seem privy to how the Oratrice works, and what it's doing. But Farina does give us a very important piece of information. 
She has absolute trust in the Oratrice to help stop the prophecy, even if she doesn't know exactly how. Traveler notices her genuine confidence, and I think out of anyone she would trust the true Hydro Archon the most. And Arlecchino recognizes that even if Farina is in the dark, someone has some sort of plan for all this indemnitium. Now, I want to get into some crack theorizing centered around this one lingering question Arlecchino asked. Why is the Oratrice collecting an excess of indemnitium? Or rather, how will it help stop the prophecy? And the primordial waters? But before I get into that too much, I do need to say this. There is someone who we know can control and repel primordial waters. We've seen him do it. Now, this is speculation, but consider this. After Nouvellet casually explains that he stopped the primordial water, we learn he's the dragon sovereign of water. And Paimon says, Well, Nouvellet, if that's the case and you're so strong and you're a sovereign, shouldn't you be able to stop this entire prophecy? And Nouvellet is like, oh, no, 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 I don't have my full dragonhood. Yet here, he went in with full confidence he can handle it, and he effortlessly pushes back and seals the primordial waters. If this is already the case, then what could Nouvellet do with his full, complete dragon power? Nouvellet himself implies that if the Archon disappeared and handed back his elemental authority, he might be able to do something. But he says given the status quo, he recommends finding another way. This struck me as odd because other Archons have surrendered their noses, so I don't get why she would need to disappear. And even if she had to, wouldn't the Hydro Archon insist in order to save her people? Perhaps it's Nouvellet who is reluctant, but if there's a reason for that, it's definitely not obvious. So if the crisis could be resolved by giving Nouvellet the Gnosis, why, if my speculation is correct, is the Gnosis instead collecting Indemnitium? I'm just thinking out loud at this point, but Nouvellet told us when the first usurper arrived on Teyvat, they seized a part of the dragon's power. Today, that stolen power is the basis of the Archon's authorities. I think we're quick to assume that he's referring to a Gnosis, but given this conundrum about Indemnitium, I'm inclined to think it's more complicated than that. I think the Gnosis is an important part of this, but I also think the Usurper maybe took so much more. I mean, the Primordial one isn't even Primordial. Look, he even stole the name! This next part is going to be very creative. Not everything is going to make sense, but I invite you to play with me in this space. Join me, travelers, on this transcendental journey into the awakened mind. Let me be blunt. I think the Oratrice is being used to collect Indemnitium to help Nouvellet repossess his full dragonhood. This goes back to my speculation that Indemnitium is prime or primal energy. As I said earlier, I call it this on the basis of Elaine Guillotine's study of Deshret's technology, and how Archie annihilation reactions are likely derivative of Deshret's energy system. And you can see similarities between all three, as well as other annihilation reactions, particularly with Kavarna and Divine Nails. This last part may seem out of left field if you have not seen my most recent video, but if you want more explanation on the Kavarna Divine Nail Oratrice connection, uh, go watch it. But in short, a lot of it has to do with power having will, and a lot of things having this theme of judgment and retribution. And also, it's all cyan. The prime energy is cyan. And even beyond Indemnitium, Archie, Deshret, Kavarna, and Divine Nails, we also see it in Domains, Enconomia Doors, various Seals, and even Mind Earmensel and Seelies. Yes, we're still color matching, folks. So hear me out. Perhaps this primal or primordial energy was originally the power of the dragons, and going even further, maybe even the fabric of the world before modern Teyvat. Imagine then that many things we associate with the divine, we only associate with the new world because Fani's took it and called it theirs. Perhaps the heavenly principles not only stole the dragon's authority by stealing the Gnosis, but also by rewriting the rules of all of their power. So with Indemnitium, Maybe by having the Hydro Archon play a role in generating this new primal energy, it's similar to Kavarana in that it also has the ability to rewrite the rules. Rene had written in many notes that Kavarana, and also Abyssal Energy, is an order above elemental energy. 
So giving Nouvellet a gnosis with this higher order primal energy could be a way for him to truly reclaim and repossess the power that's rightfully his. Okay, listen, I warned you this was crack, but thank you for reading my fanfiction. But yeah, this is wild speculation, especially because it has even more wild implications. The Divine Nails, for example, may be celestial in design, but the power was stolen. And Divine Nails and Kavarna are both excellent at repelling abyssal energy, but I don't think it's celestial versus abyssal power. It's Light Realm versus Void Realm. And speaking of Kavarna, this brings up a very interesting issue of Seelies. The dragons we know of seem to be based on various sea slugs, and Oceanids and Seelies also seem to be inspired by sea angels. So they're all basically marine gastropods. So again, this is crack, but I think Seelies may very well either be some sort of branch or cousin of dragons that submitted to Fawnies. Alternatively, Fawny simply created Divine Envoys from dragon energy. But I think this is all why I also think that Nouvellet's appearance and skills remind me so much of a Seely. Speaking of Nouvellet, I need to go back to something weird he said. When he's sealing the primordial water, why does Nouvellet ask for forgiveness for overruling the sentence? So I mentioned Master Ruggiero and his research of ancient magical arts of pre-Remurian and also Remurian civilization. The magical arts seem to have a connection to music. Remurians recorded everything with music, and Fortuna itself is a symphony. And based on some other things, it sounds like Remuria inherited these arts from the unified civilization, or even before then. I don't think it's a coincidence, that Seelies are also associated with music and beautiful songs. So, my point is, Fortuna may be a Seely thing. And by my reasoning, if it's a Seely thing, then it's also a prime energy or dragon thing. But the note also introduces a very interesting term related to Fortuna. Ruggiero says that such great symphonies were connected to the fundamental power, we haven't heard the term fundamental power, I think. Let me Google this. Okay, oh. oh, I see. Maybe it's primal energy. The energy that's everywhere. Okay, cool. That's crazy. So Ruggiero said that these symphonies were used by gods to control civilizations, and I guess perhaps these are actually dragon powers. And the prophecy Fortuna is one of the grandest of symphonies, so perhaps only the most powerful may also be able to wield it. Someone as powerful as, say, mm, the original Dragon Sovereign of Water, maybe? And if Fortuna, or this prophecy, the crisis that Fontaine currently faces, is a form of punishment, it might make sense that the only sin here is just being human. Because we've definitely met at least one dragon with a disdain for humanity. So I think it'd be really funny if the prophecy is a curse put on Fontaine by the original Dragon Sovereign of Water, only to be stopped by Nouvellet, the new Dragon Sovereign of Water. Maybe, in fact, Nouvellet is the only one who can stop the prophecy. As I said, a lot of this is just half-baked speculation, and there are a lot of flaws and holes and unanswered questions. Like, for example, a potential Narcissenkreutz connection. Or even more importantly, how Child might be floating in the Primordial Sea with a huge Abyss Whale? Like, Child and the Abyss Whale are like a major plot point and they have to show up, but I didn't even mention them at all, so I, I, think, that, I think there's a few flaws with my theories, guys. I don't know. I'm missing a few screws. Thank you so much for watching. I've enjoyed torturing you with my brain rot, and I hope you enjoyed at least some of it. I just personally find it fun to just discuss ideas and just get creative, you know, don't take it too seriously. It's all about the journey, not the destination. Maybe the real lore was the friends we made along the way. Thanks again for watching, please like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, share with your friends, and yell at me enthusiastically in the comments with your own ideas and theories. Make sure to check the batteries in your smoke detectors to make sure they're working, and stay safe. All right, bye.